Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Joe Tata. As I sit here on my computer looking at the date in the upper right-hand corner, it's Wednesday, September 15th, which places us right in the middle of the month of September. And as you know, the month of September is Pain Awareness Month. Now, in years past, I've done lots of different things for Pain Awareness Month. I've done courses. I've held um, online summits, which, which hosted 30-plus experts. Um, I've done courses for professionals, courses for people with pain. This year, I was trying to figure out what are we not talking about in the chronic pain space that we need to bring more awareness around? What should we be talking about? What can we bring some more disruption around to kind of disrupt our you know, pain care world out there that isn't always as effective for people with chronic pain? And as I started to kind of just reflect on my practice and the patients I've seen over the you know, 25 years I've been treating patients, looking at research, And I said, we need to talk more about the link between trauma and chronic pain. So this month, I've done a couple of different things to raise awareness around the trauma pain connection. The first is I've done lots of different posts on my Instagram um, handle. So if you can head on over to Instagram and just find me, my handle is really easy. It's at Dr. Joe Tata. So that's at Dr. Joe Tata. You can find me on Instagram. Just like and follow me. There have lots of great posts and sliders that are perfect for you if you're a practitioner or if you're someone with chronic pain and you want to learn more about the trauma pain connection. And the second is I partnered with a physical therapist this month. His name is Dr. Jeremy Fletcher, and he is hosting or uh, teaching our first trauma informed pain care course. You can find that by going to the integrative pain science institute.com, head on over to the courses tab and scroll down and you'll find the Trauma-Informed Pain Care course that's open now, and you can register. It's available for CEs as well as CEUs for physical therapists and other licensed health professionals. It's about seven hours long. Lots of great content. Jeremy, of course, is a physical therapy educator. He currently works for a company called Veterans Recovery Resources, which is a not-for-profit organization, which helps veterans with both their physical as well as mental health needs. He's a dad, he's a coach, and he's also a survivor of trauma himself. He's a veteran from um, the Afghanistan war. So he brings lots of professional as well as personal input to this topic. I've learned so much from Jeremy. Um, Him and I lectured last year at Combined Sections at the APTA National Conference. We're going to lecture again this year um, at the National Conference, which is in February. So you can meet both of us there if you're around. And then finally, I've reached out and partnered with people like our guest today, Dr. Robin Walzer, who is an ACT-trained clinical psychologist, and she's one of the world's leading experts in treating trauma and PTSD. So let me tell you about Dr. Walzer. Dr. Robin Walzer is director of TL Psychological and Consultation Services. She's also an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley and works at the National Center for PTSD. As a licensed clinical psychologist, she maintains international training, consulting, as well as therapy practice. Robin's well known as an expert in acceptance and commitment therapy, specifically for the treatment of trauma and PTSD. She's co-authored, I believe, six or seven books now. We're gonna talk about that on the podcast today, including a book on Learning Act. Robin's work spans traumatic stress, depression, substance use, and of course, chronic pain. She's written research articles, chapters, and books on these topics, and she's been doing ACT trainings and workshops since 1998. Robin's really incredible. I've seen her in action at a couple of uh, national conferences through ACBS. I've also read a couple of her books. They're great, so head on over to Amazon and make sure you check out all of her books, but kind of dive into today's episode and just listen to the kind of the, the topics that her and I are talking about around chronic pain and trauma, and just see if it kind of resonates with you, and just kind of think to yourself, How much do I really understand about trauma, PTSD, adverse childhood experiences, um, the social, political, contextual aspects of trauma? All these are really important factors when it comes to treating people with chronic pain. Okay, let's begin today's episode and let's meet Dr. Robin Walzer. 
Hi there, Robin. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. Great to have you here. Hi, Joe. Thank you for inviting me. I've been wanting to chat with you for a while. Um, I had an opportunity to sit on a training with you at uh, an ACBS conference a couple of years ago, and it was um, very impactful. Helped me with my ACT skills and um, ACT and chronic pain and trauma have so many overlaps. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, I just want to start because I don't know your history. I mean, I know your history of an act as an act trainer, but I don't know mm -hmm. your history as a, a professional or, or a person who's become interested in trauma. How did that journey begin for you? Sure. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation as well. And um, I got interested in trauma long uh, before I knew about ACT. And so that's where my roots started. Uh, my master's degree uh, was on uh, trauma with sexually abused women as compared to non-abused in psychotherapy, looking at things like their level of knowledge, uh, birth control, guilt, a number of different things. And so I had gone to uh, University of Nevada, Reno, to work with Victoria Follett, who uh, was uh, interested and still, she still is interested in trauma at the time I wanted to continue my work in that area. And then I got up to Reno and attended a Steve uh, Hayes uh, ACT workshop in 1991, if you can believe it, long time ago, long time ago, it was my first workshop. And it just blew me away. I mean, uh, I had this sort of complete shift. I mean, I was already on the trajectory of like not really liking the idea of cognitions being illogical, irrational, dysfunctional. And then when I attended that workshop, it just like, and I totally came into this place where acceptance made sense and perspective taking self as context was just like, wow, this is really amazing. And I continued to work on trauma, but I started going to Steve Hayes's lab and basically grew up in Steve Hayes's research lab at UNR. And I guess the rest is kind of history from there. I've been doing acceptance and commitment therapy work and training um, since really since 1991 with my first workshop delivered in 1997 and uh, have been on that path ever since. Yeah, it's great because so many people are just hearing about ACT now, especially in the chronic pain world. And it, I'm happy that you're going to talk about obviously how long it's been around and um, some of the research and effectiveness for trauma, chronic pain and you know, really everything in between. So at that point, I guess you were, because you have your PhD in, in clinical psychology, I guess at that point you were still uh, in a master's program, it sounds like? Well, so I got my master's at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I went there first and then decided to um, continue on and then went on and got my PhD. And the master's at UNLV, it's kind of interesting because as an undergraduate, I was kind of in this place where we were really interested in cognition and looking at, um, you know, how cognition plays a role in our human maladies and this kind of thing. And sort of much more in the big C, little b, cognitive behavioral camp. But then when I went to UNLV and started working on my master's degree, um, there was, there was a lot more behavioral sort of orientation there. So I could start to feel that shift there too. And then of course, UNR is like all behavioral all the time, or at least it was when I went there, it's been a long time. So I'm not sure if they still have that intensive of, of a focus at the, at UNR. Uh, I think it's probably because I'm going to kind of weave in and out of some of these concepts. So when you say little c big b some of the some of the mental health providers who are listening kind of get that right away um, others might not quite understand what that means can you just tell us what that what that what you're talking about when you say that sure so 
one thing for people to know is that acceptance and commitment therapy comes under the broad umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy. So it fits in that category. In the sort of second wave um, interventions that we were seeing during during the, you know, probably the 70s through the early 90s was a big C, little b, cognitive behavioral intervention. What I mean by that is that the focus on interventions was cognition. And what you wanted to do is go in and manipulate or restructure cognitions in such a way that it would change emotion and thus behavior. Sort of a, a back first, when it first started, a very linear process, change the thought, change the emotion, change the behavior. As time went on and the third wave of behavioral therapies and cognitive behavioral therapies started to emerge, that focus shift and it's sort of little c, big B, and the focus tuned into behavior and what can we do with an individual's behavior. I think this, when you think about um, what ACT is doing, right, is like we don't have to feel good in order to behave consistently with our values. So the target is the behavior here and now versus feeling good or thinking differently before you can begin to live your life well. So that's that shift. It used to be think, feel good, think good, then live. And now it's um, let's get right after it. Let's get in there and work on living well, a values-based life in the here and now versus and just be with your emotional experience and your thought experience, very mindful quality to it. So that's what the, the shift was in a sort of big C, little B, big B, little C process was. Excellent. So let's, I want everyone to just kind of put that on a post-it note in their mind, because I'm going to connect that in a couple of moments with some other things. So my next question kind of leading in, Robin, I guess just first tell us what your definition is of trauma or um, PTSD, so we can kind of give some background as we move into some of these topics today? Well, it's an interesting question because um, as you may know, uh, Joe, um, there's the DSM-5 uh, criterion, which includes that there must be an event that demarcates the diagnosis. So you have to have some kind of a traumatic event where you feel helpless where your life or someone else's life was in danger or you um, learned of a traumatic uh, death and so there has to be an orienting event in order to receive a diagnosis of PTSD and to get that diagnosis you would have intrusive images and thoughts hyper arousal more anxious more alert more aware uh, you would be avoiding anything that reminds you of the experience. And then you'd have alterations in mood and cognitions, like maybe feeling guilt or thinking that something is wrong with you or bad about you because of the fallout of the trauma. So that's sort of the standard, like technical, straightforward definition. But if you work in the field of trauma, what you learn pretty quickly is that it's not that straightforward and that there's complex trauma, which is trauma that occurs over a long period of time where there's no defining event and maybe your life wasn't in danger, but your safety is threatened. So that might be something like longstanding childhood physical or sexual abuse. And the impact is such that it's not just that you have those four areas of symptoms that I talked about with PTSD, you also have lots of relationship struggles and a learning history that contributes to other challenges, aside from just what you might see inside of PTSD. Mm -hmm. And there's one more term or two more terms that I'll just mention briefly, and that was sort of talked about as big T trauma and little t trauma. And so the big T trauma is the PTSD of the PTSD sort. And the little t trauma is more like I had a, a friend who committed suicide or I had um, a critical 
parent who just berated me constantly and I could never get a break from it. I never felt safe under those circumstances. Um, although, the, well, the friend who committed suicide could be a big one, depending on how you learn the information. Uh, uh, but it could also be a smaller T, like I'm just grieving over, over the loss of this individual. Um, it wasn't shocking. I knew they were depressed. They'd been talking about taking their life for a long time. And I'm just have a lot of grief around it. And I'm struggling with it. So there's lots of different ways that you can think about trauma, but um, I tend to be very clear about it when I'm doing intervention. And um, often when I'm working with clinicians, I remind them to be a little bit more specific when they're talking about which kind of trauma, because sometimes people label everything trauma. And like you have um, something that's emotionally overwhelming and the clinician says, oh, that's a trauma. That's not a trauma. We all have uh, times in our lives when we feel emotionally overwhelmed by things and that doesn't make it to be a trauma. And so being very specific around what you're talking about can be useful in terms of how we communicate and define these things. Mm. So many good points in there. Just kind of want to let those settle in for a minute and the questions <laughs> yes. just involved in all of that. The first thing that comes up for me is as you're talking and, you know, as many clinicians do, like, you know, we're kind of textbook first and we're thinking we're going back to, you know, what we learned in school and what, for lack of a better word, what, what systems, how systems dictate how we treat patients and their influence there. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the, the criteria that you're describing from the DSM fits well with chronic pain and oh, yeah. fits well with, you know, what might be termed somatoform disorder, um, depending on how someone is diagnosing it. And the other thing, when you're talking about big T, little T and making sure we're clear in our language, I think as, as professionals, we model behavior for our patients. We model behavior for, you know, our family and friends, that there's a difference between, let's say, um, maybe persistent or toxic stress, a little T and trauma and helping call it what it is might help frame someone's journey to recovery better. Yeah, so let me see if I, so like there can be intense stress where like you and I going through school and we had to take a test or something like that. And we're like studying and it feels really hard and you know, you're going to be evaluated, but it's time limited. Mm -hmm. right? And then there's chronic stress. Let's say you're in a job that's highly demanding and you have a family life where after work, you have to go home and take care of the kids. And you're just under like constant sort of intense um, calls for you to be uh, on your game, uh, and then there's basically a no stress. And you can, I think you can kind of categorize trauma in some of those, like there's some kinds of trauma that equal that chronic high intensity and some that are kind of more momentary and uh, then just no trauma at all. And people can get caught up in those, mix those in ways that are problematic. And so I think you're right, like in clearly defining it, we can target our intervention a little bit better. Uh, is it a lifestyle change or is it just a coping skill that you can use in the moment when you're under, uh, you know, time limited stress or something like that? Yeah. Does that make sense a little bit where I talked about it? I hope. It makes perfect sense to me, especially the, the work, the, the school stress. Remember that really well. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, yeah. we all tend to remember that really well. Comes right back. It's <laughs> it's hard to forget, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Eight years of school is enough. Um, so you mentioned a DSM. So technically, trauma is a, psychi a psychiatric diagnosis. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, that puts it in the realm of psychology. And traditionally, whenever we put anything in the realm of psychology, we think. Okay, maladaptive thoughts, problematic thinking, rumination, um, uh, problems dealing with feelings, et cetera, all that. And, you know, problems with memory, traumatic images, et cetera, et cetera, right? Right. right. All that's vitally important, as you know. How do we bring the brain and the body together 
with trauma and help raise awareness around the idea that trauma is not just a brain-based condition, but that it's a whole body condition. Yeah, I know. I think it's a great question. And uh, um, I suppose one of the things that, and maybe you're going to talk about this more uh, or ask me about it a bit later. I do want to say that um, chronic pain and trauma are highly correlated and people can have chronic pain as a result of trauma. Or we also know that people with trauma are more likely to have chronic pain. And so, you know, they're the the relationship is pretty strong and that I work at the uh, VA and many of the veterans that I work with have both PTSD or subclinical PTSD and chronic pain. And so I think these kinds of uh, uh, issues are very important. I'm going to, there's, I have a little bit of a longer answer about DSM. And so do feel free to like interact with me around this just a little bit so that I don't get off on a crazy tangent here, but um, PTSD in some ways is one of the few uh, diagnoses that actually have an etiological origin, which uh, depending on what kind of trauma you're talking about which is what the DSM was supposed to be, but never became. And so we had a long time ago, the medicalization of human experience and Rick sort of along with the cognitive, the rise of like, let's focus on cognition, that all of our pain is about what we think And we sort of separated mind and body in a way that I think was probably not very useful. And that was due to the medicalization, right? Because it's a very um, machine or or like humans are machines and you've got to break about, break about the parts or break the parts of, uh, uh, break all the, everything down into its parts as a machine and then look at what's broken and fix it. Mm -hmm. Just like you might do if somebody has a broken bone and the problem with that is that emotions are not broken. Uh, thoughts are not broken. In my opinion, they're not dysfunctional. They're not irrational. They're simply thoughts. And if you have a thought that that's a dysfunctional thought, that's a thought about a thought. You still have to do the analysis of the second thought that it's a dysfunctional thought, right? So there's more work to do. And in that area, and I think that ACT nicely does it with its understanding of human languaging, but the, the piece about separating mind and body, I think, creates a problem. And really, when you look at what's happening uh, with trauma, it's impacting the whole entire person. And that somatic experiences are very important. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a client who came to me who had all the symptoms to meet criteria for PTSD. And she was a uh, manager of a bank and she'd had two um, hostile takeover uh, bank robberies in a two week period. So it was a really close in time and both of them in both of them weapons were involved. And so the first one created a lot of anxiety, but the second one was particularly bad. And uh, she had a, a gun held to the back of her neck, pressed up to the back of her neck. And when she came to see me, it, the main thing that she um, was distressed by wasn't the thoughts of the bank robbers or the entire experience. Of course, that was distressing, but she kept feeling the gun at the back of her neck. Mm. Like somatically, she kept experiencing that pressure back there. And so, you know, clearly that's an example of how this is not just about what's happening in your head, it's about what's happening with your body. And our whole body responds to trauma, right? Like adrenaline doesn't just go to the brain, (laughs) you know, like it's released and our whole system is activated. And we need to to look at a a whole perspective when we're treating, not just um, what's going on in the mind. Great. And I want to kind of, I want everyone to grab that that sticky note I posted for everyone before, because that 
big C, little b, big B, little c. Traditional trauma treatment started with traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, which typically has a big C component to it. But you very nicely articulated um, somatic experiences, interoception, all those are body-based, um, you know, symptoms and respond well to body-based treatments. And a lot of trauma, in fact, responds well to body-based treatments. So as a professional, should we start, should we start thinking about a little bit more of a, a B and, and maybe a little smaller B when working with people with trauma, or is it a case by case basis? I know it's hard from an ACT perspective because ACT, ACT looks at thoughts as behavior, which is not typical in traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but I, I, I love the, the synchronicity between trauma and chronic pain because they're both really embodied experiences that people are struggling with. Yeah, no, agreed. And um, I think that uh, when I'm thinking about treating trauma, I, of course, see thinking as behavior, because that's the perspective that I'm coming from. Uh, uh, and I, but I want to treat the whole person. And so, for instance, if I'm looking at the system of anxiety that's on high alert, you know, hearts are beating fast, there's a feeling of tension, uh, you know, there's a maybe the experience of something heavy in the gut, like whatever is happening for the individual, I want to do exposure work, willingness work, in such a way that they are more interested in some ways in the bodily experience of it than I am what's happening in their head. I mean, of course, I'm going to look at that too, uh, but I want to get them fully present to all the experiences that they're having in their body, becoming aware of them, changing the perspective on it so they can see it as an experience that they're having, watching its rise and fall, noticing its intensity and quality and how it shifts as they continue to observe it. And essentially we're creating new learning here, right? Is that they learn that these experiences are not dangerous, that um, they're safe, even if those experiences arise and that they can be with and hold these experiences without the need to avoid and move away from things that they care about in their lives. And so um, I also want to say we do look at thoughts, right? But we're seeing them for what they are, thoughts, and we're having people take perspective on thinking, seeing mind as um, a learning like critter that doesn't unlearn. We can't unlearn. It just learns and we, it adds to learning. And so what I'm hoping that folks will be able to see is that they can observe the ongoing process of thinking and they don't have to get all entangled in what their mind is saying about them as a result of the trauma. Just like I would if uh, working with someone with chronic pain, like your mind is going to say things like, I can't do it, or this is impossible, or how can I go on like this? Um, sort of pulling people away as with trauma from what they care about and what matters to them and meaning in life. And so diffusing from disentangling people from their mind mm -hmm. uh, in ways that help them to step forward in meaningful values-based engagement um, in the service of vitality rather than in the service of happiness. Now, some people might think that's an odd thing to say, right? Like what, you don't want people to be happy? Of course I do. But uh, we don't walk around happy. Happiness isn't a permanent state. Uh, and there's even research that shows, and then I'll, I'll pause. <laughs> I'll pause, Joe, so you can um, hold this as you're thinking about what you want to ask. But um, that shows that if you are trying to suppress pain, you're trying to eliminate and get rid of emotional pain, that we're not very good at targeting that single emotion and saying, I just want that one to go away so I can have all the others. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if you try to push one down, you push them all down. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not willing to have emotional pain, you're also not going to have joy. Mm 
Like you cut joy off as well. But if you open yourself up to experiencing, you're available in the moment for pain or joy, whichever one is there. Yeah, there's vitality and in, in, in vulnerability, basically, in those instances, yeah. which, I think, which I think is great. And as you're talking and you're, you're mentioning learning, and you've mentioned a number of times now, and I love the, just the simple concept of looking at the human organism as uh, an organism that learns, right? So we're just all day long, we're learning. That's really what we're doing in many different ways. And through our therapy techniques, and as you mentioned, through exposure, there's new learning that happens there, right? So we can layer on all these different new layers on top of your old learning. Instead of looking at the nervous system as something or the human body in, in essence, something that you turn on and off or you delete things from, or you have the ability to extinguish, so to speak. There's so many different words that are used in, in all sorts of different you know, research and things like that. But it's really a different perspective of approaching someone, I think the ACT motto with the exposure base that it has is so important for people with chronic pain and for those with uh, trauma PTSD. No, I agree. And that if, if we're able to learn um, and see our whole selves as experiencing beings, right, which is not typically how it works. Like we grow up in a cultural system and this is a lot, this happens this way a lot around the world where you sort of lose contact with experiential way of learning. And instead you're just focused on verbal learning or mind and people sort of get up into their minds and they forget that they have a whole system here, like you're saying, that's learning and interacting with the world. And so part of this work, this new, this new learning is to actually see the whole system again mm -hmm. and get people back in touch with experiential ways of knowing the world and that emotions rise and fall, thoughts come and go. Like we're a, a beings in motion is another way to say it, right? Like we're not holding still very much. Even if we're holding still, there's tons of emotion, sorry, tons of motion going on inside of us, including emotion as well, but like we're, we're in motion. And so uh, we need to get back in touch with that sort of whole process of just constant movement and change. And that when we can see that we're going to be less threatened by certain thoughts or feelings because they're going to change, they're going to move. Now, with chronic pain or uh, what we might call chronic PTSD, people say, yeah, but I have this all the time, right? Like that's sort of the standard response. It's always there. Well, it's interesting, though, and you can, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, too, is that if you actually mindfully watch your experience, even chronic pain or the feeling, the experiences that come along with trauma, you'll, trauma, you'll see those shifts you'll see that it changes in quality or it disappears or the thought rises and then it falls and the experience in your body sort of grows and then it contracts. And then it, right. Like if you're watching, there's lots of different things going on. Yeah. And sometimes patients will tell you that right away when you're taking a history and you ask, where's your pain? And they'll say, well, most of the time it's in my lower back, but sometimes it's down my right leg. Sometimes it's down my left leg. Sometimes it shoots up to my neck. And yeah. there, are, there are, you know, our patients are, you know, dropping the crumbs for us to follow, basically. There are, there are uh, seeds there for us that we can kind of then pick up and start to work with. Because it's interesting, you know, when we think about pain and we put our focus on that, we tend to have more of that. It becomes more intense. And as we start to kind of pull apart all those pieces of pain, and instead of seeing it as just a sensation, picking it apart and then seeing it more of an experience then that experience starts to change. There's room for that experience to change. Yeah. Being what? present to it. Yeah. 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 One of the places I know you do a lot of work around is uh, training professionals. And you probably have, I know you have a, a recent book out called The Heart of Act, and you've done some uh, papers on, on it. 
when I've watched your trainings and I've watched you work with some patients and I've watched you work with professionals who are struggling with their own stuff, um, you're able to adopt an act stance that if, you know, if people are familiar with the, the act competency form, I can just go through there and um, I think you display that beautifully. And thank you. As I've, and I know it, it takes time to cultivate that. And as I've trained PTs, especially where they come from a really a background of um, pain means technically that something's broken and we have to fix it, so to speak. And then they start to approach their patient care like that. And when they come to act, um, people are either PT specifically are either completely confused. <laughs> um, they're blown out of the water and just can't get enough of it. Yeah. Or they're trying to figure out where does like, where does like the fixing end and the nurturing begin, so to speak. Um, so I wonder if you can just talk about the importance of the act processes and the act stance in a professional skill set. Sure. And this is what the heart of act is about too. And I think that um, if you're learning act and going to do it well, you need to be applying it to yourself uh, that you are uh, practicing living more fully in the moment you're conscious of your experience, you're making choices that are based on values and, you know, engaging in uh, behavior in that fashion that's uh, lined up with those values. Uh, but the other thing that I think is important for clinicians to know as their learning act is that like, there's no sort of done, there's no arrival, just one that I'm aware of, right? That's a uh, the end, <laughs> you know, right. The, that we, so I've been doing act now for 31 years. Is that, is that right? Am I, is my math right? I think that's correct. And um, I'm still learning. I'm still gaining information. I'm still practicing my own mindfulness and awareness processes. Um, and so one of the th things that I would say is that there's like, not a place that you're going to get to where you go, oh, that's it. Now I've done Act the answer and I've fixed it. It's more of I'm going to be working on accepting for the rest of my life and valuing. And we can translate that to our clients as well. That acceptance is an ongoing process and probably should be turned into a verb instead of a noun, right? Accepting versus acceptance, that it's always there to be done and practiced and that valuing is always there to be lived. And I think that that can help with some of these ideas about, well, where do we get to the part where we move from fixed to nurturing or something like that? No, it's nurturing from the start mm -hmm. and all the way through. Uh, if that makes sense. And the fixing is in changing the behavior, not in, in changing the internal experience. Right. So not necessarily in changing someone's pain, whether that's physical pain or emotional pain. As you mentioned, it's how do we start to modify or change your behaviors based on what your values are, not mine, not anyone else's, but figuring out what your values are. What's meaningful to you? Like when you, you know, come to the end and you look back, um, you know, what legacy will you have hope to leave? And so you've got to start living that legacy now, though, if you want to create it. And I know with chronic pain, like people feel frozen by their pain, just with trauma, just as with trauma, they feel frozen by their trauma, they can't step forward. And what you know, we want to convey here, and we want to do it thoughtfully, right? Like, um, some people, when they get active, their pain flares up. And some people with trauma, when they visit their family, they get triggered, right? And so we want to think about it thoughtfully, but being present and open and willing to engage those things is going to be different than this pain has to go away. My trauma has to go away before I can live because life is short. And it will unfold very quickly in avoidance and non-connection if you're waiting to have these things disappear. 
Because people come to professionals like us because they're looking for change, right? Yeah, and absolutely. We, we start to kind of steer them, not necessarily that pain relief is never going to happen because oftentimes it does, but the change that you're looking for exists in the, the valuing, not necessarily the pain relieving efforts. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what, what will, how will your behavior change versus how will your thoughts and sensations and emotions change? They're, they're going to change regardless, right? But so how, what will you do with your behavior? They'll come and go, they'll rise and fall. Now, I want to be careful when I say change, right? And you'll keep learning. Like we add, we keep learning. And so, uh, you know, both experientially and verbally. So we might learn that, yeah, pain is part of my experience, but it doesn't have to mean that I can't live meaningfully. If you had to give us a, like a top tip or th three strategies or your biggest frustration around the treatment of trauma as we currently exist, I guess, here in the, in the United States where we are, what would they be? Well, if I were just to think of, let me do tips and then I'll do frustrations. Um, if I think of tips, if um, you're treating trauma, you got to expose to the traumatic material, the what's happening in the body, what's happening in memory, those kinds of things. You need to expose to those things. Secondly, getting people behaving according to their values early on is really important so they can get that experience of building a meaningful life right away. And then third, and this is just uh, important to me, uh, uh, is my understanding of acceptance and commitment therapy, helping people recognize self as context perspective taking is just incredibly valuable. And that once people can connect to this um, ex felt sense and this experience of I am more than my trauma. I am more than my pain. There's freedom inside of that. And I want to get to that freedom as quickly as possible. So those are sort of three kind of tips that I would think about when working with uh, trauma and pain for that, for that matter. Um, frustrations sometimes have to do with what's going on in the field of psychology and sort of this notion that feeling good is the only way to feel. I don't know if that's the kind of frustration you're talking about, but um, certainly um, well, I keep getting the message that feeling good is the, is what you have to do in order to have a meaningful life. And I would just use small examples here to show that that's not the case. Um, Meaning might be found, for instance, in being present to a family member passing away. You know, that doesn't feel good by any means, but it might be incredibly meaningful. And you want to ask yourself, is this pain that I'm going to feel what I'd want to do in the service of being there for my family member? And I know for myself, that answer would be yes. And I've done it, right? I've done that. And so um, I kind of get frustrated when this idea is held out that feeling good and thinking positive thoughts all the time uh, is uh, the way to be. If I were, if I were a, um, in charge of psychology, I would get rid of this idea of negative and positive emotion and thought. Just thought and emotion, I guess. So that's one frustration. Um, is that the kind of frustration you were thinking about or looking for? Whatever frustration you have is fine for me, but that's a pretty good one in the in the pain world, actually. Um, yeah. I think just the, the labeling of, you know, good feelings and bad feelings can be a really slippery slope for some people. Well, it, what it does is it takes human experience and turns it into a problem, mm -hmm. right? is that the feel, the emotional experience of pain or, uh, you know, that there's a problem and we're hell bent on, you know, fixing problems and minds are very um, uh, task oriented and they want to get those kinds of things done. But what if you have chronic pain? Like, how do you fix that problem? And, you know, if I want to ask, how do you live well if you have chronic pain versus how do I get rid of it? 
Yeah, the, the, reversal, uh, you know. the, re the reversal process is different, basically. Instead, yeah. of, uh, instead of approaching that reversal of pain from the, from first we have to get rid of what's bad, then we can focus on what's good. In a lot of ways, it's actually the opposite. Yeah, exactly. That let's focus on what you care about up front. Let's start that process now. Um, I don't have too many other frustrations like with, with clients or people who have trauma and chronic pain, right? Like they're just, that's what's happening for them. And um, so I want to be there and present and compassionate and working with them in a way that is um, helping them move forward in life. I think my frustrations arrive with clinicians who <laughs> kind of get kind of sucked into this idea that you know, there's only one way to be in life and that's happy. And I, no, I should say too, by the way, Joe, I'm a fan of happiness, right? Like I like it uh -huh. and I want to invite as much of it into my world as I possibly can, but I'm not going to do it by not tasting other parts of life. Yeah. And that's also why the, those at core competency skills are important because if you're working with exposure effectively, you have to be able to be present with that in yourself, yeah. in your client, and in that space between you and the client that's constantly shifting as well. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. I've been speaking with Robin Walzer. She is a licensed clinical psychologist and ACT trainer. Uh, she has incredible books. Robin, I think you have, is it seven books, eight books? How many books do you have on ACT now? Um, I believe I'm now at, I'm, I'm working on an eighth. So we're close to eight. <laughs> oh, can, you, can you give us any insight into the eighth? Little, little sneak peek? Well, the one that's just coming out, the seventh, is Act for Anger, which can be useful for folks who have a chronic pain and trauma. Um, it's a self help book um, coming out with New Harbinger. And then um, myself and Manuela O'Connell are writing a, a book for APA on just straightforward skills in ACT and uh, like literally just do this process with this skill, do this process with this skill. And um, that won't, that won't be coming out though for another year and a half or something like that. We've still got time to write it. That's great. We've so, got the contract signed and we're starting to de <laughs> develop the, the outline, but we're, we still got a lot to go. Yeah. Of course, everyone can find those books on Amazon. If you just go to Amazon and um, look up Robin Walzer act, um, those will all pop up. And then Robin, let people know how they can follow you and how they can learn more about your work. Yes. So I have a Facebook page called the heart of act. Um, so folks can go there. And uh, I also have a website, TL consultation services. If folks want to um, contact me or ask questions or see some of the other work that I'm doing. And I've opened a Twitter account. <laughs> just Robin Walser. I'm not very good at social media. And so I have to really work at it. And I've, I'm um, uh, just got it opened a couple of months ago. And I'm going to start tweeting, I suppose, here pretty soon. And but it'll, it's probably tweeting is out of, is tweeting still popular? I don't it's, know. It's still out there. It's definitely still out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, what the problem is, is that I want to get away from these devices as yeah. much as I can when I'm not working. And so I'm just, I don't hang out on these places very often, but they're there and I do welcome people to come visit. Well, we will tag you as soon as this podcast goes live, we will tag you on Twitter um, okay. so you can uh, practice your tweeting skills with us. And of course, <laughs> at the end of every podcast, I ask people to share this with your friends and family. And if you want to give Robin a little help, share this and tag her on Twitter and say, thanks so much for the interview, Robin. It was great to learn about ACT trauma and the convergence of chronic pain. Um, again, Robin Walzer, you can find her. Um, all her books are on Amazon. Her website is uh, tlconsultationservices.com. We'll link to that in the show notes if you want to come over to the website and find it there. And make sure to share this episode with your friends, family, and colleagues on social media, in a Facebook group, on Twitter, wherever you're following uh, the podcast. I'm Dr. Joe Tata, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrative 
www.haynesciencesinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends. 